I am not an attorney and nothing in this video or related materials constitutes or should be considered legal advice. This video and all related material are for entertainment purposes only. Have you ever taken a dumb idea way, way too far? Like a really dumb idea that you just decided to entertain a bit for like the bit, but should have stopped after an hour or so? I have. So a while back, we were all posting cursed images in my Discord, and someone posted this abomination. If you don't know what it is, it's an Obrez. Short explanation is that it's the Elbonian variant of a Mosin Nagant from back when a fledgling Soviet Union could not into machining, but still needed their army to have sidearms. After looking at this for about 10 seconds, I thought, you know, this looks like what a raider in Fallout would have, like to come at me, if they were forced to follow California gun compliance laws. And then I had an idea. I had an awful, wonderful idea. What if I attempted to complete Fallout 4 while following California firearms laws as closely as possible? If I could only know then how much pain this would cause me. So I really committed to that bit and spent a solid two weeks going through the California statutory codes, mostly the penal code, looking for everything and anything in regards to the ownership and use of firearms, encompassing everything from what is defined as a firearm under California law to how often I am allowed to purchase them. Now, remember that I am not an attorney and nothing associated in this video or this video itself is legal advice or should be considered so, but I did make a big old list of all the rules I have to follow complete with statutory citations. There are a lot of rules to follow in this challenge, so for the sake of brevity, I'll give you the basics. I must follow all California firearms laws as closely as possible. That means my guns must be lawfully acquired, here meaning that from an already established vendor in world, and since I did this before a certain case became law, and I wrote this script before that ruling got challenged, I must wait at least 10 days before using a firearm I purchased and I may only purchase a gun once every 30 in-game days. My firearms may not be automatic, I may not have magazines or other means of storing more than 10 rounds at a time, and I may not have rapid reload or armor piercing modifications, the latter being a stand-in for no armor piercing ammo. Nothing 50 caliber or higher too. I also have to purchase my ammo from vendors or make it myself. No scavenging off enemies. Also, no grenades or other weaponized throwables. No concealable weapons. And for the purpose of this run, the player character is considered a private citizen for the entirety of the playthrough and cannot circumvent any of these rules by joining a military faction. And yes, this is the short version of the rules. I also just want to emphasize for what will be one of like a million times in this video, I am not an attorney, I do not work in any field of legislation, litigation, or otherwise legal capacity. I am not trying to give any legal advice or commentary on California firearms like legislation and rules or anything that could be considered legal advice in any capacity or general counsel. This is just a funny joke I took too far. Uh, nothing here is legal advice. Additionally, I make no attempts to say that this is wholly accurate to like California firearms regulations. A lot of things needed to be tinkered with to make it work in a video game. Now for a bit of disambiguation, we are following the spirit of these laws, not the letter. California has a list of all the guns you're allowed to purchase, and because all of Fallout 4's guns are fictitious, none of them are on it. I've made my own version of the allow list that goes over all the guns I can possibly use for this run in that spreadsheet I talked about earlier. On that note, while I do have citations for all of these statutes I'm following, they are cited either directly to the California legislature's website or through Find Law, and for good reason. Unless you're working in a law firm or a California government body or going to a California university that has a law library in it, it is highly unlikely that you have easy access to a copy of Deering's or West's like statutory reporters. Do you have any idea how pricey a subscription to Lexis or Westlaw is? On that note, I did the research for the rules back in December of 2023, and I based my rules based on what's called black letter law. I've been following certain litigations and changes in legislation, and well, in my not an attorney and cannot give legal advice opinion, things are far too messy right now to try and alter things based on new rapid developments, or rapid for the speed of legislation. And finally, for the purpose of this run, we're considering microfusion cells to be bullets and fusion cores to be sources of power like a battery because, well, every weapon that would use a fusion core for ammunition is banned in this run anyway. And finally, finally, 
Quest reward weapons are considered the lawful transfer between two parties which are subject to the waiting period but still allowed. And no, don't worry, it is not you. This stuff is insanely complicated. It took me two weeks of research just to get a rough rule set. So what are the goals here? We can't just try and speed run this as that'd defeat the purpose. For starters, we are playing on survival to make the waiting periods mean something and we have four major objectives. Get to the end credits of the game, defeat Swan, complete the Minuteman quest line and clear Quincy to avenge the old Minutemen and get to the top of Trinity Tower. That's a good spread of quest completion and test of strength for the run. And before we get started, let's take a minute for ourselves since I'm not really into that sponsorship game. Instead, let's just take this minute to think about something nice that happened to us today. It doesn't have to be something big or something particularly cool. It can be something simple, like maybe you got the settings on your toaster just right this morning, or perhaps there wasn't much of a line at the store. It's pretty easy to get wrapped up in all that bad stuff that happens to us on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really important that we take the time to remind ourselves of the nice things, even if they're little ones. Just try to remember that when you're going through your day and things sometimes seem doom and gloom or you're fixating on something nasty that happened. I know sometimes I get like that. And now with that out of the way, I fire up the game and run it with all the DLCs because I didn't bother to really think about if those would affect things. We'll talk about that later. Now let's just see how bad this can be. I wanted to go into this as prepared as I possibly could because this is actually my first time playing on survival mode in Fallout 4. After a bit of reading around, I decided to go with a build that emphasizes agility and getting a perk called Blitz as early on as possible. Stealth, lots of action points, and closing distance quickly are going to be very important for me because I don't exactly have a lot of firearms at my disposal. I start my game as you do and make it all the way to the Vault 111 People Freezer before I run into my first problem. I can't use either of the starting weapons you're given in the vault. The 10mm pistol has a magazine capacity of 12, which while I'm not exactly good at math, I know that 12 is more than 10. Well that sucks. But what also sucks is that the starting melee option, the security baton, is also off limits, as the penal code section banning concealed weapons explicitly prohibits telescoping batons. Never mind that neither of these would be acquired through a licensed vendor, they're just sitting there on the ground, which I guess for the 10mm pistol that's a thing, but melee weapons are a bit different. I had to restart my game here because on my way to grab the Pip-Boy, I accidentally picked up one of the 10mm pistols and since I didn't have the Pip-Boy to interface with my inventory, I couldn't unequip it. Lucky for me, one of the few auto saves in survival mode that they give you is right after you thaw out in Vault 111. I stomp and punch bugs out of Vault 111 to see the world around me has become a wasteland. Time to show the world the power of California compliant firearms. Things aren't looking too good in Sanctuary Hills. The only person still around is my robot butler Codsworth from the before times and he isn't very helpful. He just wants to wander around the neighborhood despite me being very sleep deprived and dehydrated from my popsicle nap. Before I even think about leaving Sanctuary though, I need to set up food and water. There is going to be a lot of waiting around during this playthrough and I need to eat, drink, and sleep to stay alive. After a bit of scrapping, I set up a bed near a few hand pumps where I fill all the empty bottles I found in the vault so far. Bottles and other ways to get water are going to be very important during this run because we're going to need a lot of purified water. On top of hydration, it's the most consequence-free way to heal in the wasteland. I also take the time to consolidate and plant any foodstuffs I find around the area, but that's not going to be very helpful until I can attract some settlers. I don't have the stuff to make a settlement recruitment beacon just yet, and the traditional way you get your first few settlers is off the table. In order to get the Minutemen out of that museum, you gotta take on that dev claw, which normally is more of a big set piece because the game just hands you a suit of power armor and a minigun, but I can't use a minigun and I don't even have a weapon yet. Let's try to fix that. As soon as I walk out of Sanctuary Hills, I find my first weapon. I can't use that icky non-compliant gun on this wastelander, but that tire iron is totally allowed. Meet Mr. Bonky. He's gonna be our best friend for a bit. I head on over to Red Rocket and meet my first companion, Dogmeat although they never actually call him that in this game. I've decided that companions are okay so long as they follow the rules too, and last I checked, dog meat doesn't use guns. We have a nice time testing our strength against these dangerous mole rats for their delicious meat, which solves our food problem for the time being. We need to get more though. 
Dogmeat and I wander over to Abernathy Farm, where the Abernathy family have no problems with me harvesting all their crops for them. More importantly though, Abernathy Farm is the first possible vendor that we can go to, where we can lawfully purchase a firearm. Unfortunately, all they have is a basic pipe pistol, which has too high of a magazine capacity for us to use. We'll have to come back later when maybe Connie Abernathy might have a pipe bolt action, which is something we are allowed to use. But for now, we promise to help them with their raider problem before heading back to Sanctuary with all of their tatoes in our pockets. We do a little more planting and building in Sanctuary because even if we have no immediate need to build out our settlement, as we have no means of attracting settlers, building gives us a small amount of experience, which is just enough to get to level three. We've got our blitz perk now, plus a point into sneak to help with getting the drop on enemies, and that that should totally be good enough to take out a handful of low-level basic raiders in one of the easiest areas in the game. Right? We sneak on over to the satellite where the raiders are hiding out, but before I can get a single hit in, the dog outside the raider base one-shots me ripping out my goddamn throat while Dogbeat just stands there. Great. We try again, but before we can even get back to the satellite, a pair of raiders and their dog notice me, and even with Blitz plus my absurdly high agility for stacking lots of attacks in VATS mode, they drop me with a shotgun like I'm a sack of potatoes. Twice! I can't even take out the dog with Dogmeat's help before these two wake up and one-shot me. Um, could you excuse me for a second? <laughs> It's at this time I realize that I have no armor and endurance was one of my dump stats so that I can get a really high agility. That's not the best of situations. I make the decision that I should probably explore the far northwest of the map before going back to the raiders. I double back to Red Rocket and clear the mole rat caves to get some food items and easy XP, and then head back to Sanctuary to grab a few more morsels of experience by just exploring and building more. Then I head over to Wicked Shipping, which turned out to be a great success. While the ghouls hanging out there were surprisingly tricky, there was a single raider who I was able to blitz down and defeat, and with that, I now have a full set of the most basic armor in the game. But things get even better. While I was carefully skirting the fringes of Concord as to not accidentally trigger the Minutemen quest prematurely, I discover a baseball bat. I don't even need to wait 10 days to use this. I take it back to Sanctuary and kit it out as best I can, naming it the Crumgler. I also find a knife that I name Stabilis, but I never use it. I milk a bit more experience out of setting up Sanctuary Hills, and then I set out with the Crumgler. I am now level four. I have a full set of armor, even if it's not a very good set. I am ready. I approach those dudes just hanging out in the woods with my newfound power, and I crumble the shit out of them. I approach the satellite tower to get my revenge, and a goddamn mole rat with a landmine tape to it insta-jibs me. Now I have to fight all those dudes in the camp all over again, which I have no one to blame but myself since they literally have a sleeping bag for me to save in right there. I clown on those campers all over again before carefully sneaking up on the satellite base and tactically ordering dog meat to take out that mole rat because he has plot armor and I don't. I find a nearby bed to save in before entering the raider base where I find out the hard way that there's a dude with a mini gun in there. Thank God I remembered to have a little nap outside the base. Another try later and the Raider gang is dealt with. I head back to Abernathy Farm where turning in the quest means the settlement is now affiliated with me and therefore I have a renewable supply of foodstuffs. Time to finally get a gun that I can lawfully purchase. Since after a couple in-game restocks, Connie Abernathy still does not have a firearm that I can use in-game based on our rules, the next nearest vendor who sells weapons is in Covenant. That is going to be a long, dangerous trip. I make the mistake of trying to help out some guy who wants to drain this quarry, and after getting dismembered by the lowest tier of Meyer Lurks in the game more times than I have ever in any Fallout game before, I decide to just halfway do the quest and move on. I'll, I'll deal with that later. I also wander into the General Atomics Plaza where the game just decides that I need to die. That was weird. Eventually, after a few encounters, I make it to Covenant, where I have just enough money to be able to not only afford the stuff I need to finally build a recruitment beacon for Sanctuary, but also my first gun. It's a bolt-action pipe gun, which we're just gonna assume has a legitimate serial number on the upper and all that good stuff. Remember that we've designated all pre-established vendors in-game as licensed firearm dealers for this challenge, including Miss Enjoy Your Stay over here. I don't trust those dead eyes. Five hours in and I finally have a firearm. 
I can't use it for 10 in-game days, and I better make this work because I can't get another one until 20 days after that. I return to my pile of rubble triumphantly and spruce up the settlement in anticipation for all the new settlers we're going to get. Charisma is also a dump stat for me in this playthrough, so we won't be getting very many. My confidence strengthened, I strike out to see the world and get murdered by one random encounter after another, like this rad scorpion who I don't even get down to half health. I realize now that if I want to get anywhere, I'm going to need to build out a network of settlements where I can rest and recover before going deeper into the commonwealth. I stopped by Ten Pines Bluff on my way to Covenant and picked up a Radiant Quest to clear an area for a settlement, which just so happens to be the best possible one for me right now, Sunshine Tidings Co-op. It's close to Sanctuary and due south, so I can start making a caravan route to Diamond City. I still get murdered by a ghoul trying to get this done because ghouls turn out to be pretty spicy in survival mode. Not as spicy as this random group of gunners that deletes me off this overpass though. I finally make it back home to Sanctuary where it would seem that Codsworth doesn't want to do a whole lot of anything except stare at the side of this house. Thanks buddy. I wander out once again where I run into the Brotherhood of Steel. Thanks to their help, I survive the ghoul attacks only to walk into a landmine. I really need to get that light-footed perk. The game isn't done punishing me for being stupid though, as on my way back to Lexington, I get mauled by a Yagwai, and then the next time I get point blank mini nuked. And then after that, I step on another landmine because what the hell is learning my lesson? I finally make it back to the Brotherhood of Steel, and you bet as soon as I survive that like wave of ghoul attack, I save as soon as I got near a bed. Okay, it's been a long, rough trip to get a foothold into the Boston Metro, but now I have two places near enough to Diamond City to serve as a staging ground for trips into the Metro. One trip across the river later, I find myself at the gates of Diamond City where Nora Dark from the television show DC's Legends of Tomorrow is trapped outside. After a little sweet talking, Nora and I get into the city and I get this shiny new, slightly better baseball bat called The Sprumgler. Nora wants to do an interview with me now, since after the fairy godmother thing didn't work out, she got into citizen journalism. I decided to take Nora along with me with my newfound confidence of having another set of hands to back me up. I get utterly wrecked trying to take on the raiders at the USS Riptide and have to do everything after finally surviving that ghoul fight with the Brotherhood of Steel all over again. <laughs> I decide the USS Riptide is a silly place, and this time I ignore it on my way home to drop off some stuff and restock on water. I also put some armor on Nora Dark because this isn't a comic book show and people know how to aim out here in the wasteland. I also take the time to build an ammo manufacturing setup that I will literally never use in this entire run. This time, I set out for Bunker Hill as that's a pretty good place to stock up on junk items needed for crafting, and I can never have enough places where I can find a wasteland doctor to get diseases cured, because those are really stacking up right now. We make it there was little incident, agree to help out some guys find their dad's old hat, and then I head back home to get my first gun ready for use when the time is right. At last, after nearly 12 hours of suffering, I can use a gun. Behold, Sprongolo. It has been 10 days since I first purchased that pipe gun in Covenant, and I can finally take it out for a spin. I decide to head back to that quarry where I knew the raiders were going to be hanging out and take a few pot shots at them. One problem though, the textures in the quarry just weren't feeling it today. I end up dying a couple times because I literally can't see what I'm doing thanks to whatever error this is, and decide I'll come back later after maybe validating my files and taking the texture settings down a tick because this seems to be a problem with ultra textures. That's completely irrelevant though. I've got another problem I need to solve. I need more water. My settlements are starting to accumulate people, and more people means more production, and more production means that I can build more water sources, but also that more people other than me are consuming it. I've got a few large-scale pumps going, but it's still not quite enough to use water as a primary healing source outside of combat. I have a slick little plan, though. I head over to Beantown Brewery, which has a shitload of bottles and only a handful of low-level raiders hanging out in the place. Nora Dark and I clean the place out, and now I've got like at least a hundred empty bottles. I head over to the nearest settlement, Oberlin Crossing, and while I'm not formally allied to it yet, 
They give me a quest to go clear out another place and that's enough for them to let me use their hand pump. It takes a solid five minutes of this animation to fill all these bottles. And now I've got a lot of water and all my low risk hydration and healing needs are met. In case you didn't know, most healing sources in survival mode either carry a physical need penalty like making you thirsty or increasing your chances of getting a disease the next time you rest in a bed, with purified water being the lowest risk, lowest penalty healing item in the game. It's very handy to have a lot of these on hand because even if in the long run they won't heal a ton of health, having a lot of them makes that not a problem. But do you know what's better than having a crap load of purified water? two crap loads of purified water. I mosey on over to Diamond City, not only to restock on bullets from a licensed vendor, which I'm just going to say we did the paperwork off screen, but also to pick up the quest Confidence Man. In case you didn't know, if an area in Fallout 4 needs to be part of a quest stages, it'll get reset when the quest hits the stage where it takes place in that area. Do you know what that means? As soon as we get to the final stage of Confidence Man, all those empty bottles respawn. I get it was a nice that I could help the DJ too, but now we are set for healing and hydration for the foreseeable future. Time to grind up some quests and rack up those perk points. I don't do any of the major quests or the story quests here. I'm mainly focusing on things that get me new settlements because while the quests themselves do not give you a lot of experience points, all the building associated with getting a settlement ready for people nets you quite a bit of experience and it's the most consistent way to gain XP since I'm not really in much of a position to be grinding enemies enemies right now as all I've got is a weak melee and the one gun I do have is already under leveled. Never mind that I need to go into town and spend all my caps when I run out of ammo since lawfully purchasing my munitions means I can't just loot bullets off bodies. I get my ass handed to me several times dealing with the blood bugs at Taffington Boathouse and then I run into another problem. I never disabled the DLCs, meaning that I'll get random automaton encounters which are basically guaranteed wipes right now as I have exactly nothing that deals damage to the well-armored robots. We're still extremely hydrated though, so uh, I guess it's cool. What isn't cool is me not learning my lesson at the USS Riptide. I had to do the Confidence Man quest all over again because I thought it was a good idea to take it on again at this point, and it was more for the principle of not letting these guys push me around. I'm not gonna let these shits in their shitty little boat mock me. I gear up in Diamond City and head back out, and after a few hours of grinding, I decided to return to that bridge on the USS Riptide and not continue on until I have cleared this shithole. I decided to take a new tactic, and instead of starting the attack from the bridge itself where the raiders could easily run up to me, I hang out on the riverbank and snipe at the raiders where they can't see me thanks to this awning. Thanks to the sneak attack bonus, I can just barely one-shot the low-level raiders, and I'm just far away enough to where the raiders won't see me and get bum-rushed by all of them at once. The real problem here is a high higher level raider that's in power armor, which through carefully, carefully taking pot shots at them with sprong glow, I'm able to kill them without getting detected. After a bit of cleanup work now that the big bad is gone, I finally defeat the USS Riptide, only to get pancaked by a group of super mutants two minutes later. Thank God I learned my lesson about saving every chance I get. Now that I have finally defeated the stupid boat, it's time to receive a new gun through the means of private transfer. I didn't take Paladin Dance up on his offer to join him in clearing out Archjet systems because at the time I literally had no gun to defend myself and a baseball bat isn't exactly the best thing to take on a bunch of synths who are carrying laser weaponry. I've also got Nora Dark whom I've re-gifted the Crumgler to because her default weapon is a non-compliant 10 millimeter pistol and NPCs will always use the best available type of weapon in their inventory, meaning she won't use the California compliant pipe revolver I gave her. Switching Nora to a melee weapon, Fix is that. The three of us wander into Arcjet and man, there's a lot of cool stuff here. I'm gonna have to come back and scrap it later. Everything goes pretty okay as we clear out the lab, except for that when we get into the rocket chamber, Nora tries her fairy godmother magic again and it glitches her out. Luckily, this is a modern Bethesda game where companions cannot die and they just get upset then go home. You can pick them back up as soon as they get to their like normal spot. Another thing we're gonna have to deal with is the junk jet. The junk jet is a potentially game-changing item for us because, well, it doesn't seem to fit the definition of a firearm based on my layperson and not an attorney deductions. It flirts dangerously close with the definition of a destructive device according to the penal code. It's marked as unclear on my allow list, and in the end, I decided to not use it because frankly, it's really heavy and we are playing on survival, so every pound of available carry weight counts. Plus, Dance gives us Righteous Authority, a legendary variant of the laser rifle, which is allowed so long as I use it with a 
sniper capacitor, which keeps it under 10 rounds per magazine. After we do all the paperwork off screen, it'll be a staple of the run in 10 days time. This session's a shorter one. I've been traveling up and down the Commonwealth a lot, and it's gonna be really helpful if I expand my settlement network more. Really, just getting Sunshine Tidings, Oberlin Station, and Hangman's Alley spruced up is great because those three form a clear path from Sanctuary to Diamond City. I'm also beefing up Sanctuary with things like a rad scrubber, functioning agriculture comprised of the holy trinity of crops you need to make vegetable starch with, and a total of 10 people living there. The goal is to set up a trade hub, with a doctor being the first order of that business. If we can get a doctor, not only do we have a way to cure diseases without needing to dump a bunch of points into intelligence so I can get the perk that lets me craft antibiotics, but it also means that I have a renewable source of stim packs. Also, just as a bonus, doctors tend to have the most money out of all the vendors since chems tend to be pricey. Oh yeah, Nora Dark wandered off to Diamond City. We should probably go get her while we're on an ammo run. On the way, we stumble upon a flooded township where I'm really starting to notice that feral ghouls are the biggest threat in the game after one of them two shots me inside of three seconds because thanks to the multiplier on melee in survival mode and how ghouls do this go for broke lunge attack that's very hard to block, being in melee range of them is generally a bad idea. Now take all that and multiply it by at least five or six because when are you ever fighting one feral ghoul? And remember that we cannot use automatic or even rapid reloading firearms to mow them down before they can close the distance. Let's get out of here. So we get to Diamond City and Nora Dark has no issues with rejoining us after we left her for dead and maybe saw that it was kind of her own doing as we didn't exactly ask her to teleport herself into the middle of a rocket test firing chamber and fall to her incapacitation since no one's allowed to die in this game. That might mess with the plot. And it's nice that she's back with us, but what's nicer is Arturo's stock. While we were grabbing some more bullets for Spronglow, I see this sick super sledge, which is for now a straight upgrade to the Sprungler. This thing is awesome. It does nearly double the damage of the Sprungler and there's room for improvement. I'll need to start dumping points into weapon modification perks, but for now, this thing needs a name. A name that will show it means business. A name that strikes fear into the hearts of men everywhere. A name that shows I can definitely be trusted to give things custom names in video games. Yeah, that'll do. So we take the old slapper for a spin, and I think it's time we formally make some friends by joining the Brotherhood of Steel. They're the first faction, not counting the Minutemen, that you can join in-game unless you want to risk it by going to the railroad at a low level. And on top of not wanting to have to deal with those bulky paladins and power armor later in the game, plus hostile vertebrates, there's a big benefit of joining them later on in survival mode. It's not the power armor, that's actually pretty easy to come by late game. If anything, for that, the only reason why we're not using power armor right now is because fusion cores are extremely scarce. We pick up the radiant quest from the guys at the police station and after a bit of ghoul violence that's just enough to level up again. Let's celebrate by stealing all the bottles from Beantown Brewery again because it's been just long enough for them to respawn. You can never be too hydrated in a Fallout 4 survival run. So Sprongglow was always kind of a weak point that I needed to have sneak attack headshots if I wanted any chance of reliably killing enemies with, and I think it's time we upgrade it. Last time we were at Arturo's, he didn't really have anything that fit our needs, so let's check out Covenant again. Surely, there is nothing horrific going on in this idyllic, old world style settlement. We're gonna start the Lost Patrol from Paladin Dance, since that's kind of on the way and just something we can do in the area. We also help out this traveling armor merchant since there is a chance that he can have pieces of armor that give us bonuses to our special stats, and that's just generally a nice thing to do. The fight kinda takes us in an off direction though, and we start walking along a area and see this trailer, and oh my god, that's a sentry bot, run. Run, we cannot fight this. Just get out of there, man, just go. Remember that the spiciest weapon we have right now is a super sledge. And with our middling at best strength and no points into melee bonuses like Slugger yet, we're not gonna do nearly enough damage to take this thing down before our tiny HP pool is just ripped right through. Remember, we're a stealth build right now. 
Nora, Dark, and I run like hell, furiously chugging our purified water as we go. We wind up by that old crashed plane, which isn't too far from Covenant, but uh, we gotta deal with this guy hanging out here first. It goes okay. If anything, this clip here shows just how badly I need to start investing in the Slugger and Rifleman perks, which for the latter, I've also made the call that the bonus to armor, like just ignoring armor from perks of Rifleman, we're gonna say that's not adding armor piercing rounds, that it's us getting better at firing our rifle and therefore learning to shoot between the plates. So after all this excitement dies down, we finally head over to Covenant, and sure enough, there is a hunting rifle I can buy that fits my needs perfectly. Even fully upgraded to match the fully upgraded Sprong Glow, our new hunting rifle, which I am naming Mr. Pokey, only does a nominal amount of damage more than Sprong Glow. What we're really after is that we can nearly double our maximum capacity from 6 shots to the maximum allowed of 10, get much better optics, and generally shoot a further distance since it's better that we pick off baddies from as far as possible in this run. At least, so far. We're still not allowed to use anything that might suppress the noise a weapon makes, but if we're far enough away, the enemy AI won't be able to track us down. The hunting rifle's gonna be our presumed mid-game weapon until we can get a chance to get what our end-game rifle will be, the lever action. The lever action does nice, strong damage and fits all the criteria to fit our California compliance rules. We just need to be able to be strong enough to get the quest for and then survive in Far Harbor for just long enough to purchase one or maybe see if we can't get one of the unique variants. Experience. Far Harbor is actually a pretty important goal as we've set this run out because it's also the home to the only heavy weapons that we might be able to use. The harpoon gun skirts the definition of a firearm for this run because uh, nothing in this video or associated media is uh, legal advice and I am not an attorney, but it's kind of iffy. Like I looked it up and it seems like you can just buy a harpoon gun in California, no problem. I even remember like going down to a place called Sports Chalet and just seeing them out there. So as far as I can tell, those are okay. I'm kind of iffy on the other heavy weapon you can get in Far Harbor, the Striker, as that's technically just a really big slingshot, but it could be considered a destructive device, and also it's just not very good, it's kind of a joke weapon. Again, I am not the person to make definitive calls on any of these. We head back to Sanctuary to kill some time and also to spruce up our armor. This morphs into me going back and forth between my northern corridor of settlements, which are currently Ten Pines Bluff and Taffington Boathouse, hopefully finding more along the way so we can get close to the Nakano residence. Back at Taffington Boathouse though, after we pick the suspiciously well-guarded boathouse's lock, I max out Nora Dark's companionship and get a bonus that would be helpful if I had it early in the game or maybe a high enough charisma to regularly do speech checks. I don't go for the romance option though, because my only love is safe and sane gun regulation. My charisma isn't bad though, I've been putting points into it because I needed the local leader and bartering perks if I want to establish shops and I really, really need those doctors at my settlements. After hoarding some caps, I finally build a clinic and assign someone to it. I celebrate and go get my ass kicked at the unfinished housing development full of super mutants, then the secret gunner base under the middle school, and by attempting to advance the Lost Patrol. It's time to start doing things. Things like advancing the main plot line. We're 28 hours into this. Of course, I take the time to improve my settlements even more because that is still the most consistent way to gain lots of experience without blowing through all my ammo I need for the big fights. I need to go to Diamond City for more ammo right now, but along the way, we spruce up Oberlin Station and Hangman Asali, as well as going back to Arcjet Systems, where I also make the call that it's okay to loot the guns off enemies, but if and only if you just immediately scrap them for materials and so long as you make sure that you dump any ammo you get from scrapping them. If anyone else wants to do that, I'll leave that decision up to you. Nora Dark was also picking up a lot of guns off the ground anyway because the companion AI just makes it do that. Like if it sees a gun better than it has, it just goes for it. And I can't just throw these all into the river because that would like bring the game to a crawl or I might accidentally dam up my water source in Sanctuary. The high-end scrap from Arcjet really helps with getting nicer things for my settlements, and nicer things means more people, which means more production. Once we've ammoed up in Diamond City, and we can use it as soon as we lawfully acquire some microfusion cells from a licensed vendor. So it's time to follow our lead on where Detective Nick Valentine is and check out Good Neighbor. Good Neighbor is a pretty cool place. We pick up some quests, we see the sights, and we meet up with that vault tech rep from the beginning of the game. We now know where Nick Valentine most likely is, but something distracts me along the way. We happen upon Hubris Comics, and I remember that I got a quest to pick up a thing from there for the Brotherhood of Steel. Small problem. 
feral ghouls are busted in survival mode, and I repeatedly get two shot by ferals that are literally coming out of the walls. I am frustrated with these shits at this point, and how I keep having to run through three different loading screens to get from the hotel I saved in at Good Neighbor to the inside of Hubris Comics. I start scouring the metro area looking for a nearby bed to save in, which gets me killed a few more times, but eventually I find this bed in the state house, which has a lot of mire lurks in it, but at least I stand a chance against those things. Okay, so uh, let's do what we're here for in the first place. We go down into the metro tunnels and sneak our way into the abandoned vault. I have an easier time storming a vault full of submachine gun toting raiders LARPing as mobsters than I did with half a dozen ghouls in a comic book store. The whole area isn't so bad, and even has some conveniently placed mattresses for saving. And with Nora Dark, we're now a party of three until Nick Valentine returns home. Things go pretty smoothly, except for that I find out that I can't scrap legendary weapons, so I just start stuffing all the drops in work shops where no one will touch them. I thought about making some sort of gun buyback clause where like once a month I might be able to vendor trash legendary weapons to Arturo or something, but I had this idea so late in the run that I wasn't sure how to properly implement it. I, there was a lot going into this playthrough, but we still miss stuff, you know? In the meantime, I also do a whole lot of settlement building for XP in this video, which I have cut out so much of because really I'm just killing time waiting for 10 day waiting periods to expire because if I just sat there for like 24 hours at a time, I'd blow through all my food items. Once we've got Nick taken care of, I take the time to do the Grey Garden quest since that's a nice midway point between Sunshine Tidings Co-op and Oberlin Station, and also means that the water treatment plant will be cleared and I'll be far less likely to get rocket sniped by super mutants. Things go okay, and I only die once inside of the treatment plant. I come back to Grey Garden for my reward, and then the real reward, which is all the XP I get from building up the settlement there. I kid you not, I get more XP from building housing in Grey Garden than I did for doing the quest, killing Meyer Lurks and Super Mutants included. Sure. Each thing nets you well less than 10 XP, but you are building things, individual items, in the hundreds, and it's all gonna add up. We're level 26 now, and our perks are starting to snowball. We've got all the light-footed perks, three points in Riflemen, and we're getting pretty close to what we need for uh, certain enemies. But first, we have to go somewhere else. Welcome to Feral Ghoul Hell, Population Me. This session was less than three hours, but has the highest death count of any session by a sizable margin. It was at this point that I realized I really, really need to prioritize getting the melee skill buffs over everything else because I really, really need the AOE bonus from swinging my weapons. Before I descended into the depths of ghoul hell, I got utterly clowned on by the random encounter with like the granny ghouls and I did not heed the warning the game has sent me. I thought I was ready. I was a fool. My ego was fed by being able to take out a random encounter Yawai without too much incident. On my my way to a radiant quest for the Brotherhood of Steel, clearing out Poseidon Energy, not exactly a super intense location. The ghouls nearly kill me before I even get to the building. I can't even make it a single minute inside because the ferals throw themselves at me and I just explode. I'm starting to think that Knight Reese at the, per like, the police department was trying to set me up here. Oh yeah, and on my way here to this realm of torment, the game also reminded me that rockets are still guaranteed one-shots as some random raider cast explode on me. I end up clearing this place after a couple deaths of Poseidon Energy because it has the closest bed I can use. I end up reloading here a lot. Clearing out Poseidon energy was an actual goddamned struggle. As I am becoming all too familiar with, feral ghouls can easily attack you while you're performing vats based attack, and they don't seem to stagger, ever. My slapper is a high stagger weapon, however it's really slow, and feral ghouls make you stagger a lot. I keep trying this over and over again, changing my tactics up between stealth, baiting them out, and using Nora to tank, but I keep getting stun locked and then three shot or sometimes even two shot by random ferals, and every time I start to get close to clearing the first room, a couple more spawn in and get me from behind. <laughs> It's bad enough that there's a legendary reaver outside that nearly kills me every time before I go in. Eventually, I decide to just be cheap and save scum. I'd rather run in, kill a couple ghouls, then run out to heal and save in that bed at the raider outpost before running back in to kill a couple more and repeating the process until I clear the area. This works for the most part, with me eventually clearing the first room and I start working towards that inner area in the back of Poseidon Energy. Unfortunately, this tactic isn't going to work on the last encounter, which is a glowing one in a couple of his 
bodies in the final area as they smack the soul out of me in a single charge. I finally settle on just letting Nora Dark run in and tank since she's got that plot armor. And then after some careful positioning, we finally take down the ads before taking out that glowing one at the end of Poseidon Energy. It took me over 20 deaths to clear this singular area. I return to the police station and see that Knight Reese is a little surprised to see that I'm back. Jerk. I take my 101 caps and get out of there. It's at this point that I remember that the inciting encounter for the Automata quest line is right next to the Brotherhood of Steel outpost and I keep getting roped into that fight. So this time I just prepare and take it head on. Luckily, I am strong enough to survive a wave of robots coming at me and I clear the encounter. I tell Ada to go hang out in Sanctuary for now and ponder my life choices. I'm kind of on the fence about if it was a good idea to leave Automaton enabled when I started this game because there's not a whole lot you get from it and it spawns some per pretty intense encounters early in the game. Then, even if you do the whole quest line, the rest devils will still spawn. While robot attacks can be pretty good for farming high-end materials and steel, if one catches you at a bad time, you're done. There really is only one good thing that comes from midway through the quest line, and it's something that we'll get to in a bit once we get out of here. I decided to take on something a little less punishing after my ordeal with the ghouls and the robots. The unfinished housing development by Taffington Boathouse. It's a pretty nice time. There's actually quite a few good drops out here once you clear the place, and it just so happens to be nearby the next stage of the Lost Patrol. Things are going pretty okay, but I noticed that I'm getting low on ammo right about now, so I'll need to hit up a licensed vendor soon. The National Guard Depot has a bunch of pretty cool stuff in it as I'm doing the part of the quest. Never mind all the good materials inside, there's a full set of T-60 power armor sitting outside behind a locked gate. I work my way through the main building of the depot and eventually get to the Distress Pulsar from the quest to advance the Lost Patrol. There are a lot of feral ghouls here, but we finally got the melee perk that lets us hit multiple enemies in a single swing, which means I can take out two or sometimes even three in a single blow, which really minimizes the threat from feral ghouls. I get banged up pretty badly after a glowing one shows up, but luckily the National Guard Depot has full beds that I can rest and fully heal in. So on my way out, I decided to check out that little side building nearby, and there just so happens to be a weapons workbench and a few traps as well as a feral ghoul. Also, oh hey, that's a set of X01 power armor! An incomplete set, but that's still pretty good! I spent some time tinkering with my gear before leaving because I don't have the fusion cores on hand to get this all the way up to Sanctuary, because carry weight is limited and a fusion core weighs four pounds each. Turns out, there was a sentry bot rigged to that building and it really doesn't like that I touched the armor. Okay, I am out of ammo. Like, I only have enough munitions for maybe an encounter and a half if I play cautiously and focus on melee. It's time to head back to Diamond City and ammo up. Maybe I'll have a chance to take on that sentry bot later once I'm topped off. It's time for the ammo run from hell! So right off the bat, I get clowned on by a random rad scorpion out of nowhere, which sets me back quite a bit. Rude. I start heading back towards my nearest settlement and notice that I'm nearby the next step in the Lost Patrol and think that maybe I can thin out the mutants before I go. Big mistake. It turns out that they've got better accuracy with their rocket launchers than I do with my hunting rifle. Back to the bedroom we go. This time I leave the National Guard Depot being careful to make my way through Taffington Boathouse while avoiding the random encounter trigger and the satellite array. I decide that my best course of action is to follow my settlement trail back to Sanctuary and then follow the westernmost path of settlements down to Diamond City. In case you did not know, the further west and north you are, the easier the encounters and the enemies are. Robots don't care about that though, but that still means that we have a safe corridor on the westernmost side of the map down to Diamond City. Robots don't seem to follow encounter rules for the world though, meaning that they show up at full strength basically anywhere. I get jumped right outside of Ten Pines Bluff, which knocks me all the way back to the National Guard Depot again and then I crawl my way back to sanctuary to get some water and I get jumped again by robots just outside of sunshine tidings. I get revenge on these guys though because I just respawn right there. Eventually, I make it to Hangman's Alley, where after a bit of sprucing up for pity experience, I am finally free to get to Diamond City and buy ammo. I spent basically every last cap I have accumulated since the last ammo run getting more ammo before heading over to Valentine Detective Agency. Advancing the plot is nice and all, but the real reason I'm here is because I want to be able to pick up all the side quests in the Detective Agency and get whatever I can out of them. And for some reason, I can't do that. Fine, whatever. 
I leave Nick here for now and call it a day. So I boot up the game and do a bit of XP farming by building out my settlements and then do a radiant quest to clear out some baddies at Hardware Town, which is just enough for me to get another level. We're level 30 now. We've got four points into Slugger and three in Rifleman. I think we're ready to start going out into the Boston Metro and dealing with some tougher encounters. Time for the library. No, not that one, but still pretty tough. I'm a big fat dummy pants and forgot how this quest works, so after I sweet talk my way in, I kill a few of the robots thinking they'll turn on me. This was a terrible mistake. Luckily, there's a bed near the final area. Nora Dark is trying her best here with the Crumgler, and Mr. Pokey is definitely an upgrade from Sprongglow the Pipe Rifle, but Mr. Pokey is much more suited to long-range stealth fighting, not waves of super mutants charging us head on. After a few tries, I finally clear the library, and I'm feeling confident. Let's try out Hubris Comics again, because what could go wrong? What a surprise! I got clowned on again, and even though I have the AoE effect from upgrading my melee skills, I kid you not, the rushdowns feral ghouls can do on you in survival are insane! I die three more times here, and the furthest I can get is up to the second floor. Nowhere near the final area where I can get the stupid thing Scribe Halen asked me to go get for her. This is getting ridiculous. How ridiculous? Well, on my way out, I happen to get a particularly bad roll on my random encounter, and a death claw spawns. I get into position and use Blitz to my advantage, and sure enough, I can take out a whole ass death claw while in the middle of another fight, no less, but I cannot deal with a handful of feral ghouls in a tightly confined space. Forget everything you know about the hierarchy of enemies in Fallout games. On survival, feral ghouls are right at the top of the food chain now. I decide that I'm just gonna go around and do all the good neighbor quests since I'm in the area, and I can't seem to take out the handful of feral ghouls in that radiant quest. I come across here there being monsters, but I decide I'm not gonna do it because I don't have much use for its reward. I take out my frustrations on some rad scorpions who then take out their frustrations on me, and then I do Drinking Buddy. Everything's going okay with Drinking Buddy, except for the fact that he takes a long path back to the hotel, and uh, the game just crashes before he gets to Good Neighbor. We do everything all over again before striking out to get some more farm because I refuse to learn my lesson. I die from opening a door, and after clearing out the whole street around Hubris Comics and scoring a good save point nearby, I give it one last try, turtling my way up to the top floor, and then I finally do it. I grab all the unique loot because I am never coming here again. A fun little bit of side lore here is that back in college, I took voice acting classes, and our final was a group project. This was back when Fallout 4 was pretty new, and everyone in the group I was in loved it so much, we decided to recreate the radio play of the Silver Shroud. We did everything, Foley work, setting background music, and all playing roles. In the end, I remember it turning out pretty good and having a great time making it, but unfortunately, I lost contact with all the other guys that were involved, so I can't really ask permission to air the whole thing. And on top of that, I've lost the original master. However, here's a few old bad takes I have of me hamming it up as a silver shroud in my early 20s. Dangling over a pit of fire reminds me of our adventure against the Chelsea Mangler. A mistress? The robots! They're advancing! And our weapons have been confiscated! So... Fisticuffs it is, then! And that, ha ha, is the last of them! Now, for the mechanist. But where did that vile ruffian escape to? Emboldened by my success at Hebrews Comics, I decide that I'm gonna stop in Bunker Hill for some supplies and then take on that satellite array. It actually goes great. It goes so great that along the way from the last distress pulser to Paladin Brandis, I find half a suit of X01 power armor. I can't pass the speech check to get him to rejoin the Brotherhood of Steel, but this has been a pretty big win. I haven't really used power armor up until this point, not because there are any rules against it, it's just that I don't have the fusion cores or the carry weight to keep power armor consistently running with all the legging I have to do without fast travel. Luckily, there just so happens to be a fresh core in Brandis' bunker, and that should be enough to make it to Sanctuary Hills. Too bad as I'm heading home, a raider named Boomer hits me with a mini nuke so hard that not only do I die, but the economy is going to be ruined for the next three generations. Oh, you thought this was just a challenge run, but now it's time for a cooking segment! 
for those of you that are new here, this is just what we do. Since we're neck deep in California regulations, we're gonna make a California classic of a burger. And if you just assume that's some sort of veggie tofu bullshit, congratulations, you just outed yourself as being from a flyover state who's learned everything they know about the Golden State from dudes on cable news. We're doing a pastrami burger. The pastrami burger is a SoCal classic from joints like The Hat and Johnny's. Anyone claiming that a pastrami burger is a Utah thing is spouting utter fucking sacrilege. And of all the things to try and appropriate from the Golden State, that is particularly egregious. We're gonna do some pretty simple prep here as we want the pastrami to be the star of the show. Mix your burger meat with some salt, pepper, and an egg before letting it rest in the fridge for a few minutes so it doesn't become mush. Now, crank that oven to 350 degrees of freedom heat units or whatever your bag of fries says. Start chopping lettuce and slicing tomatoes plus any other fixins you want for your burger. That's it. That is our prep. This is gonna be a quick one because burgers should be quick. Okay, get that bag of fries and we're gonna start those first because baking fries in the oven is usually the longest part of this. We're not making our own fries here because we are just one dude in the kitchen and we need to know where to save effort and where to expend it. Once those are in, take your pastrami, which should be a lot of pastrami, wrap it up and foil real good. And if your fries cook at 350, you're gonna throw this in with them for the last 10 minutes of that cooking cycle if it's higher, maybe like five. We want our pastrami to be hot, but still juicy because no one in their right mind serves pastrami on a burger cold. Pull the burger meat out of the fridge and shape it into small, thin patties that are no larger than a quarter pound. The pastrami is the star of the show here and we don't wanna leave a big old fat patty to outshine it. If you turn on the heat for your griddle now, this should be just enough time for the patties to rest before you cook them. Remember that you made these patties thin and they only need to cook for a few minutes on each side. Once they've got a good char on each side and are cooked to your preferred level of doneness, set them aside and let them rest while we pull everything out of the oven. Now, since the pan or griddle we used is still hot, now is the time if you want to toast your buns. However, I suggest lightly steaming them here. Do it quick by having hardly any water in a pot and only having the buns in there for a minute at most. Now let's assemble. Mustard and pickles on the bottom. We are not using Thousand Island or sauerkraut or anything of the like because this is a pastrami burger, not a Reuben with a hamburger patty in it. Next comes patty, cheese, tomato, lettuce, and then a ton of pastrami on top. Now is not the time for overpriced hipster bullshit that skimps on the good stuff. You do this right, and you do this by piling a disgusting amount of pastrami on top of that burger. There should be more pastrami than everything else combined on this sandwich. Now wrap it tight so you stand a good chance of getting your teeth around it and serve with fries. Behold, never mind the European mind, the Midwestern mind cannot comprehend this. Like seriously, every Midwestern burger place I've been to and I've told about this, they just look at me like how I look at people who say that Fender guitars are from LA or that they're the LA Angels of Anaheim. Now uh, eat up because I have some pain to suffer. Welcome back to the suffering. Something has possessed me to do the last voyage of the USS Constitution, which I end up dying on the final stage of. I don't know why I'm doing it because the quest reward is something I cannot use as a colonial era cannon is literally one of the examples given in the definition of a destructive device in the statute that defines them. Those are very much off the table here. I head back to Sanctuary and thanks to putting some more points into blacksmith and armor, I can really start upgrading my melee weapons and the armor I've got over my vault suit which is where I noticed something. Out of the three big blunted melee weapons, the Super Sledge is actually the weakest of the trio once upgrades are applied. I add literal rockets to the Sprumgler, but I don't quite have the perk points to have it surpass my Slapper, especially not after I upgraded that too. Since I'm here, I also tinker with some sets of power armor I've been building up now that I've got most of a set of X01. I don't leave with a set on, however, since I know I'm going to be getting one in just a sec. In the meantime, I try to spruce up my little bazaar I've got in Sanctuary and nearly go insane trying to figure out how the heck power transfer works through walls and roofs in this game. I get it eventually though. I am finally ready. I head out to Concord and approach the Museum of Freedom. Everyone is gone. It has been so damn long since the events that trigger the quest that the raiders attacking the Minutemen got bored and left. 
No matter. I enter the museum and the raiders who were leveled for a character that was supposed to be no higher than level 5 get their world rocked. I've been carefully building up my character so I can do an especially vile methodology of violence. A curse technique, if you will. Thanks to putting points into Blitz, Stealth, and Slugger, I can hit stuff with melee so long as I have a line of sight to it. And the further away from it I am, the more force I hit it with. The less the target can see me, the harder it hits. I talk to the Minutemen on the upper floor, go through the motions of the quest on the roof, and pick off the fodder enemies while I wait for the Deathclaw to show up. So I sneak around for a bit, waiting for it to wander back into the street. I align the blow up, and that big boy goes down in one hit. Behold the might of my curse technique, the blue skidoo. And then the game fucking crashed, and I have to do this all over again. And then, after I do it all over again, Preston gets stuck on the bridge, so I have to just fuck off and wait for his pathing to reset. Seeing as Preston Garvey was so awestruck by the blue skidoo that he's contemplating the nature of power while watching a river carry away sticks and leaves, just like how I carried away the souls of those raiders, I think it's time to take this curse technique for a spin. I find a group of those rust devils and they're stupid robots, so I just blue skidoo them into a blue screen. Then there was a high level Yao Guai, so I one-shotted it for the crime of hogging up the playground. Not even an alpha death claw or a museum full of super mutants can resist the power of blue skidoo. I am now the most deadly force in all of the commonwealth, but before I can take on the powers that be, another settlement needs my help. Yep, we gotta grind some settlements. One of our goals is to complete the Minuteman questline, and we can't do that until we do a few of those Radiant quests that Preston doles out every time you talk to him. As a side note here, this session was actually a bunch of smaller sessions with a similar theme of me just grinding out settlement quests, so I combined them for the sake of not having three or four chapters that were all basically the same thing. First up is Country Crossing, which I already did the quest for by clearing out those super mutants at the museum. I mentally rename it to Carlsbad because it's just off the road from the boobies. Behold, the San Onofre power plant. I think it's out of use now, or at least has been for a while. I don't know the status on its full decommissioning, but I know they want to decommission it. I start building up the settlement, but I'm running into a problem. Even with my settlements thoroughly networked into a like trade caravan thing, I am running out of wood and steel. I straight up go all the way north to Starlight Drive-In, claim the workbench, and then scrap literally every last thing in that settlement, and then carry it all over to Ten Pines Bluff, which is my nearest settlement networked into the trade caravan. And this is all just to get some wood and steel. It took me about two trips. Things are starting to snowball. I now have the means to fully upgrade the Sprungler, which means that it does more damage than the Super Sledge. This thing hits like a truck. Preston tells me to go down to Nordhagen Beach, which based on my planned faction loyalty, is actually a pretty nice settlement to have because it's right where the Pridwin will be. They want me to take out Easy City Downs, which is a bit of a tall ask, but there's a lot of loot in that Raider base and I can just watch the robots run around when I'm done. I only die once and then I start clearing up Nordhagen Beach to serve as a staging ground for when the Brotherhood show up. Since I was in the area and I needed to stock up on ammo, I head back to Diamond City before turning in the settlement quest to Preston and figure, eh, let's advance the story. I get into Kellogg's house and then Nick Valentine and I follow Dogmeat across the Commonwealth to eventually get to the Fort Hagen offices. It's here that the game performs its greatest cruelty on me. We get a random encounter legendary Rad Scorpion, which isn't too much of a hassle. The real pain comes from the loot drop. The legendary Rad Scorpion drops a mighty lever action rifle, literally the perfect perfect weapon for this run. However, because I did not legally purchase it through what we defined as a licensed vendor, I just have to leave it here. A bit of my soul died as we walked away from this. Back to settlement stuff. Next is the slow, which is... Okay, I guess. The ghouls in the pool are pretty cool, but it's in a spot that I don't really get too much. On the way there, we pass by the National Guard Armory, so I get my revenge on that sentry bot and take the half-finished suit of power armor out of spite. Also, we get that dude's dad's hat back. The guys at the slow want us to clear out some mutants, which with the strength bonus from the power armor and my blue skidoo is laughably easy. I build it out a bit before moving on. My final settlement quest before Preston will let me retake the castle is to talk to the people at Ten Pines Bluff because they know a great place for a new settlement. It's Outpost Zamoja. Not only is that way out of the way from everything else in the map, but it's also where that boomer guy was. Fine, I'm up for a little revenge. Boomer gets me once before I show him the power of the blue skidoo. I do the literal bare minimum to get this settlement going since I don't really want to come back here very often. And then I head to Sanctuary to turn in the quest. Preston gives me the quest to go and take the castle and I start getting ready. 
my first move is to make an even more powerful weapon. It turns out that the normal sledgehammer is the most powerful single blow melee weapon in the game once you modify it, and then it will do what will later be an absurd amount of damage once my strength stacks. It reminds me a lot of the absurdly powerful hammer in I Divine Cybermancy, so I name it You Game Brozuf. I can melee down sentry bots with this thing. Also, I kid out Ada because we're going to need her for a thing later. In the meantime, I head down to Diamond City to stock up before the siege on the castle. I realize it's been much more than 30 days since my last gun purchase, and I'm up for something new. Looks like Arturo knew I was in the market because he found something even better than the lever action. A Gauss rifle. I won't be able to use this for the castle, but this is the single best firearm I can get in this challenge so long as I don't upgrade the coils. 2mm is certainly smaller than 50 caliber. It's a semi-auto fire at its fastest, and so long as I keep those coils stocked, it only holds seven rounds of ammunition. I guess I'm just lucky that at the time of making the rules for this challenge, as far as I could tell in my layperson and not an attorney skill set, the California Penal Code doesn't really have anything about magnetically accelerated munitions. I named my new Gauss rifle Shift Delete because that's what it's going to start doing to things in 10 days time. Taking the castle feels more like a formality than anything. We walk up to the remains of the Minuteman stronghold, squash some eggs, and then I use the blue skidoo to one shot the Meyer Alert Queen. Seriously, when you start adding in like distance bonus plus stealth multiplier, this thing is absurd. I talked to Preston to formalize this being the Minutemen's once again base of operations and have a little chat with Nick Valentine through a wall, who I've been bringing along lately to get out of Dodge. The accomplishment of taking the castle feels even less satisfying when I get two tapped by a feral ghoul less than 20 minutes later. Oh yeah, I killed Swan too. I one shot that big boy with Eugain Brozuf. After that monster session, this one was pretty short. As I'm going around the Commonwealth, I find a nearly intact but fairly low level suit of power armor and think, what the heck, let's go for a spin. I go into the medtech building near Taffington Boathouse, where the strength bonus of the power armor lets me blue skidoo the super mutants who set up shop there into the next game. I know that I'm ready for power armor when I use it to straight up two tap a behemoth. I spruce it up a bit at the slow before heading to an actual quest, and that's where the trouble starts. I get a radiant settlement quest where I need to go help defend a settlement that's under attack. That is a problem. California has a statute that bans quote, internet controlled guns, unquote, which is more about hunting, but in our case, I have applied it to mean that we are not allowed to use auto turrets, neither hacking nor building them. To keep my settlements defended, I've been using a combination of guard posts and spotlights to keep the defense rating high enough that nothing ever comes under attack. Well, until now. It turns out that someone did move into Outpost Demoja, and since I didn't account for that because I didn't even have the beacon turned on there, it has next to zero defenses and only one person to help me take on whatever's coming. It's super mutants. Super mutants that all have rocket launchers. Even in my mostly complete power armor, that's still a one shot and I get spawn camped a few times before finally getting a clear shot and taking out the mutants. And then I died to a nearby group of rust devils and had to do it all over again. So after surviving that extremely unpleasant experience, I decide that I've hoarded enough fusion cores and I'm light enough into the game to make consistently using power armor a thing. I head back over to Sanctuary and take all the best parts of all the partial suits I found and make an almost complete suit of X01. I had to use a T45 leg though. I give the suit all the utility upgrades, including the jetpack, because at this point I have all the perk points I need to craft basically anything in this game. I try the jetpack out a bit before calling it a night because because tomorrow I become California Compliance's strongest warrior. Our power has grown. Through determination and adherence to California compliance, we have refined the Blue Skidoo to allow us to clear entire patrols of robots in a single VATS turn. They aren't even fully aware of us as they die. I decide that now would be a good time to go to Fort Hagen. Satellite base. Something I totally remembered with there and just did it just like happen upon is that there are some very, very good drops midway through the automaton quest line. I don't even bother to take out power armor since that jetpack sucks up a lot of fusion core energy and instead opt to take the Gauss rifle for a spin. Shift Elite is pretty good, but I don't really have all that much ammo for it, so I use it sparingly. 
So after pancaking the Rust Devils outside of the Fort Hagen Satellite Array, I waltz right in there with Nick Valentine and go to town on the place. There's really not much these robots can do against Nick and I, and frankly, Nick's just kind of there for moral support. And then we find it. Well, I personally did not remember why I had Automaton loaded in for the run, but my brain did. Fort Hagen Satellite Array is one of the few places in the game where you can get a guaranteed complete fully leveled set of power armor, meaning that the suit that spawned in here is a full set of X01 Mark III power armor. One problem though, this challenge has been so demanding that I've had to spend every last skill point I've gotten into something that gives me more survivability, and I do not have a single point in neither lock picking nor hacking. Nick's here in part to take a crack at the computers preventing me from getting my beefy suit of armor, and he fails out of both computer attempts. Time for plan B. I upgraded Ada to be at least a little survivable as one, having her be a viable pack mule when I need her is great, and two, I can install a lock picking module onto her. I go and grab Ada, and after some wonky pathing, she pops the lock, and now I have a shit brick house suit of power armor. I also get the Tesla armor unique to this Raider base and the Tesla gun. However, while playing around with it, I remember that we designated microfusion cells as ammunition and therefore, for the purpose of our run, energy weapons are considered firearms. And because I did not lawfully purchase the Tesla gun, but instead pried it from the cold dead hands of a Raider boss, I cannot use it. It looks cool though. I take everything back to Sanctuary where I give the power armor that army green paint job for the strength bonus and slap my jetpack onto this set, leaving the incomplete set as backup. Things are about to get a little wild. There's one snag with getting and kitting out my new power armor. My already low levels of reserve steel and wood are now even lower and I cannot do basic repairs and modifications to just about anything. I am literally running out of wood and steel in most of this world. I have already explored like most of it and it's getting hard to find new sources. Good thing I skipped the Corvega factory early in the game. There's a lot of scrap steel to be had here and I could probably get a good bit of wood from scrapping all the guns these low-level raiders use. Ada and I take the short walk over to the factory. The raiders guarding the outside can't even hit us as we approach the entryway and have to wait for us to come upstairs for them to get blue skidoo. Time to give this armor a basic test. The raiders can't even do enough damage for me to be bothered to take cover. I'm not even sure Ada is even doing any helping with clearing out these raiders, but not out of laziness, but because most raiders go down in one blow from you gain bros of, even without out the blue skidoo. And thanks to the slugger perk, a single swing can take out two or three. I think I only had to pop like a single stim pack during this entire area. Even with Ada's expanded inventory carry weight, it takes us a couple trips, but we grab everything that isn't bolted down and scrap all those naughty, non-compliant guns for their parts and wood. Time for something a little more spicy. Let's do something that gets our money's worth out of this jetpack. We gotta go and do the artillery quest to wrap up the Minuteman quest line. And on the way, there's a large, well-fortified location called Big John Salvage. It's filled with high-leveled super mutants. Ada's mainly gonna be here for carry support since she goes down in this fight a couple times and plus she can't hop fences like I can. I really get my money's worth out of this jetpack by immediately bypassing all the choke points in the salvage yard and start blue skidooing the super mutants inside. Anyone who doesn't go down in one hit gets stun locked. It should be noted at this point that you gain bros of now does more damage in a single blow than most enemies have in their HP pool before I get into Blitz's bonus or sneak attack multipliers. Once I add up the three times multiplier of Blitz when you go from maximum distance, the only things that survive the non-stealthed blue skidoo are super mutant warlords, behemoths that are epic or higher, albino death claws or higher tiers of those, and Myrler queens. And this is without sneak attack bonus or burning a crit. And it is going to get even more powerful by the time this run is over. Look at this, I can parry a goddamned nuke. I don't even take significant armor damage. I am a force of California compliant nature and uh, oh yeah, I gotta go do that artillery quest, one sec. There's one last thing we gotta do to complete the Minuteman quest line and that's setting up the artillery. We are never going to use it because last I checked, owning artillery isn't really California compliant, neither is hitting people with it. 
but we can use this as an excuse to spruce up the castle. Maybe fix those holes in the walls. Nothing ever really happens here, except for that I lose what might have been my only heavy weapon in this run, because I die on the last leg of the quest from not paying attention to a turret, and I lose this legendary harpoon gun drop I got off an enemy before getting to the castle. I decide not to go back for it, even though legendary drops are fairly consistent, because not only would it be a pain to get ammo because I'd have to go to Far Harbor for every ammo run, but I'd also have to dump five levels worth of points into the heavy weapons perk just to see how effective it is for short range combat versus you gain Broza, which at the harpoon gun short range, I think I'm better blue skidooing anyway. This session is where I decide that enough is enough and we are ready to show the major factions of the Commonwealth the power of California compliant weapons. I spend a little bit of time making a proper door for the castle because I know there's a chance one of the major factions might attack it and that goes a whole lot smoother if the synths or whoever can't just walk right through the big gaping holes in the castle's walls. I also take this time to do a couple more radiant settlement quests to spruce up Jamaica Plain and other settlements nearby the Glowing Sea as we're about to start doing quests that require us to go there. It is going to be a long walk to my nearest friendly settlement without these ones on the fringes and on top of making sure I can access whatever scrap I need for upkeep, I've also been putting power armor stations as well as weapons and armor workbenches in all my settlements so that I can fix or tweak whatever I need. I also take the time to stop by the former site of one of the universities where a city was built and then destroyed because I realize I've never been here before in any of my playthroughs. What was the Institute's excuse for massacring everyone here again? A couple of my settlements got attacked too, so I fixed them up and finally set out to confront Kellogg. Fort Hagen is less of a challenge and more of a benchmark to see how the Blue Skidoo handles close, closed off environments. I go down once from underestimating a higher level synth, and I have to walk all the way back from Sanctuary, but I find a nearby bed and remember to deal with the synths on the other side of that barred door before they get me. I plow through all those high level synths to Kellogg, whose messages over the PA seem a little more desperate as I speed through the lower levels. Maybe he knew that I wasn't even gonna let him talk. I hit him with a crit just to leave nothing to chance. And I can't use Kellogg's weapon since I have no way of legally buying this, plus I have no points in pistol skills, so that's a bit of a level sink. So the Brotherhood of Steel are finally here in force. Took them long enough. It's a bit of a walk to the police station, and on the way we see some excellent BOS piloting, eh, but we're just gonna pretend we didn't see anything here. We're locking in with the Brotherhood because they offer a utility that none of the other factions have. Fast travel. We're on survival mode, meaning there's no traditional fast travel, so getting vertebrates is an absolute game changer. We meet up with Dance et al, and we're on the vertebrate to the Goodyear blimp. We go through the motions of listening to Elder Maxon's insane ravings before we need to go and say hello to all the people we're going to mostly ignore while we finish up the story. The only person we really care about here is Proctor Teagan, because he's the guy we get more vertebrate signals from, and he's also a high level weapons vendor, meaning we can get ammo for our Gauss rifle here. And Righteous Authority, which is still chugging along pretty well despite us being fairly late in the game. We still have Mr. Pokey, but that's more of a backup to our backup if we somehow run out of fusion cells and 2mm rounds and also can't use Blitz to hit something with melee. It's kind of funny, everyone here is trying to entice me with the gift of a suit of power armor like I'm not in a suit of what's better than anything the Brotherhood of Steel can offer me. We're just gonna go along with whatever they say though because we want those vertebrate signals. Time to start really advancing the plot. The Brotherhood wants us to get some munitions for their offensive by clearing out Fort Strong near Nordhagen Beach. In case it's been a while since you last played through Fault Fort's campaign, this is meant to be a set piece where you get to use a Vertebird's minigun to take out a bunch of high level super mutants and a behemoth before going inside to do some cleanup work. There's one problem with that. Miniguns are not allowed in this playthrough. Good thing I've been dumping points into strength. I head on down to Nordhagen and decide to just walk over to Fort Strong instead of taking the vertebrate to see what happens. Luckily, the game accounted for this, but Paladin Dance didn't account for my capacity for incredible violence and just sort of stands there in a horrified awe as he sees me kill a behemoth with hammers. Well, one hammer. I've been getting a lot of that these days. <laughs> I do some cleanup with Shift Delete, and eventually Dance comes to his senses as we clean out Fort Strong. 
My armor got just a little banged up, so I decide that I should treat myself. I head back to Nordhagen Beach, and on top of repairing my already insanely strong Exo 1 Mark 3 power armor, I upgrade it to Mark 6. My defense rating is now absurd. Stuff can still damage or even break parts if I'm too careless, but at this point, there's really nothing else I can get gear wise in this run. The lever action will be a downgrade, albeit a nice replacement for Mr. Pokey, but that would require me going all the way to Far Harbor, and this playthrough is already running really long. We've indulged ourselves in a lot of distractions already, and we're going to indulge ourselves in some more because it appears that the Mechanist wants to start some shit. I get notifications that I've got two settlements under attack, and both of them are from the Mechanist robots. They're actually pretty tough for my settlers, and they're all rocking very basic gear. But once I show up, there's not much that the robots can do against me. Really, it's more annoying than anything that I need to fix shit here. I'll deal with the Mechanist later, though. I go check out another place I've never been to before, that sketchy cannery. I finally get the location, of Vault 81 because I just never got around to that and I decide to explore a bit while I'm here and I learn to the truth about this guy's suspicious snacks. Yeah, I have no idea how I missed this place in previous runs, but it's a fun distraction. The main reason why I'm telling you about this particular distraction out of many is because we find one weapon here that has the potential to surpass Eugene Brozif, a legendary ripper with a modifier that it does more damage with each consecutive attack. Do you have any idea how Busted that is! The Ripper's main draw is that while its stats are low at a glance, it attacks faster than any melee weapon in the game and can be continuously attacking by just holding down the mouse. This thing is basically a chainsword, and I am a big angry dude in power armor. You know what that means. SPACE MARINE TIME! In the grim darkness of the future, there are only California compliant weapons. The litany of challenge runs has been read, and now we're gonna LARP as a space marine for a bit because I'm just losing my mind here. I spend some time properly outfitting my chainsword and call a vertebrate to steel rain me to my next destination. Seriously, getting this perk must have shaved like 20 hours off this playthrough. I cannot stress enough how much easier things are when I don't have to walk up and down the Commonwealth stopping to fight every raider who wants to start something. We've got some grim darking to do. After giving it a bit of thought, I am most likely a salamander because my armor is green and I help all the people of the Commonwealth who call for aid, like Vault 81. It seems like a trivial thing at first, but then when we find some serious heresy going on inside the walls, we must exterminate it with extreme prejudice. We do some other boring stuff too, like the Memory Den quest, which is frankly getting in the way of our fun. We need to dismember things, preferably Xenos and Traitor Marines, and I can't do that looking through Kellogg's Walking Sim memories. And you know in hindsight, I should have seen if I could like turn my skin gray or like that charcoal color at the like surgeon in Vault 81, but I guess we're just gonna have to keep our helmet on. Good thing the next quest involves us going to the Glowing Sea, which is the perfect place for some grim darkness. The vertebrate lands a little farther away than I'd like, but we still save a ton of time taking it as far as we can go. Our armor gets a little banged up on the ride over there, but we'll be fine. We walk into the Glowing Sea knowing that the Emperor protects and that we have over 1,000 rad resistance and immediately just start killing everything that moves. I have no idea why the game is still throwing base level death claws at us right now, but it's kind of amusing that it thinks it can fight us. We have a grand time getting revenge on some feral ghouls who don't realize we're packing ceramite now, and their little lunge attacks just scratch the paint a bit. That's still heresy though. After having a bit of fun, we talk to some dudes that might be full blown chaos worshipping heretics, but we're gonna let the Grey Knights take care of that. They tell us we're a guy named Virgil. Virgil is hanging out, and after he assures us he is not Xenos, but just having a really bad skin day, we agree to listen to him so we can figure out how to get into the Institute. After leaving the Glowing Sea, I decided that I needed to enforce the Codex a little more aggressively when I stumble upon the vault that the Gunners took over. We're pretty deep into the Commonwealth, and Gunners tend to be better equipped than most enemies in the game, so the guys here will be a real challenge. Just kidding, these guys go down like Tau and Melee. Part of my armor is compromised though, so we call another vertebrate to take us home and end our little romp as we're loaded for bear with stuff the Adnek probably wants to say prayers over, and I am not carrying all of this across the commonwealth with a busted leg actuator. The final thing of note in this session is that once I'm back, it seems that the Xenos thought I was going to be away for long enough to get away with attacking Sanctuary. This wouldn't even be worth talking about, except for how everyone steals my power armor! Get out of that! It's mine! I don't want your greasy carapace touching it! In case you didn't know, Settler AI will 
always grab anything that helps them better defend themselves if they're under attack, including donning your power armor. You can tell your settlers to get the hell out of them, but the real problem lies in that traveling merchants do this too, and you cannot order them around. Trash Can Carla stole a partial suit of XO1, and she won't get out of it. As if I needed another reason to not like her. Also, this is the only session where I don't die at all, which is pretty sick considering this is also the first time I go into the glowing sea, and I also stormed the gunner's vault in it. It's time to really wrap things up. We're gonna tie up some loose ends and then hit those goals. While it wasn't really an intended goal, I'm sick of those goddamn robots and I want them to stop spawning. I finally built Jezebel a body in the last session and she coughs up the means to get into the Mechanist hideout. I slap the thing on Ada and we go for it. Things go pretty good until the very end of the Mechanist fight where those sentry things DPS me down. It's at this point I realized that there were no save points between the final confrontation and starting the Mechanist lair and I really don't want to do this crap a second time. You get to live, Mechanist. Just stop attacking my shit. Virgil said something about a courser, so we go ahead and bum around CIT until we find the signal. The display of violence leading up to the courser is fairly impressive, but the fight itself leaves something to be de desired. He can barely turn on his cloaking device before he gets jibbed, and we take that little chip thing from his guts. We're supposed to go find the railroad now, which you don't need to follow the whole Freedom Trail thing to do. If you've already been to the Old North Church, you can just go there and pretend that you didn't spend 10 minutes wondering why the password wasn't working when you were just using the wrong point of reference for when to press the button. These guys greet me like a minigun is a threat, and I just sit there quietly while they pretend they have the resources to take me on, and nod politely until they analyze the courser chip and tell me what I need to do with it. I'll take this back to the Brotherhood of Steel in a sec, but there's something we gotta scratch off the to-do list. We need to avenge Quincy on behalf of the Minutemen. It's one of our core goals. I have the location handy for the Vertibirds as I did kid in a fridge a while back, but I settle for landing at the Adam Cat's garage and use it as a staging ground. This is gonna be tough despite my absurd damage and armor rating because there's a guy with his own lesser suit of power armor and a fat man. I actually end up dying quite a few times here at the start because while I can meticulously plan my way into Quincy, I usually get nuked or cornered in some way. Ironically, it was the time that my plans got botched and everyone saw me that went well because as soon as they lost line of sight, everyone in Quincy ran out of their well-fortified settlement to come hunt me down, where they became easy pickings. I got in and scoured Quincy for every last traitor, not only in Quincy itself, but all the satellite locations until they all say they are cleared. I'm glad that this turned out to be a challenge though, since things were getting a little too easy at this point. The way this run is structured means that most of it is super hard and requiring me to play as cautiously as possible, but then once all the skill points come together, I become an invincible killing machine. I know this is in part because I finally got some power armor I could consistently use, and I'm on the fence if I'd ban that in future runs because of this. Well, like frankly, if you did ban it, you'd just end up playing the equivalent of a stealth archer since you'd have to rely on the sneak attack ability to allow you to one-shot enemies from a million miles away. But back to the main quest now that we've satisfied another requirement of the run. We take the data from the courser ship to the Brotherhood and they explain we need to build a big ol' thing to reverse engineer the teleporter the Institute uses to get around. Luckily, while we can't assign settlers to the Boston airport, we can't assign a caravan to get access to all our crafting parts at the Brotherhood. It takes all of five minutes to set up and build and then voila, we're in the Institute. Oh God, everyone will not stop talking. I swear, I almost just started purging the Institute right on the spot because everyone here just monologues at you with no end. We promise to help Virgil though, so we mind our manners for long enough to get free reign of the facilities so we can go steal back the serum that he needs to unmutant him. Himself. Another benefit of this is that if you don't immediately talk mad shit to father, he won't mark you as an enemy of the Institute and you won't have one of your settlements attacked by the synths. We report back to the Brotherhood of Steel and they've got some other projects for us before we can see the credits. It's time to end this. We got a few things to take care of before we can take down the Institute and see the credits though. For one, railroads gotta go. Honestly, this one was laughably easy. What wasn't so easy was that between looking for parts for Liberty Prime, we have to put down Paladin Dance. Unfortunately, Charisma is still a dump stat, and I miss the great Mentats. They literally leave right there for you if you want to sweet talk Elder Maxon, but hey, heresy's heresy. 
We spend some time in the glowing sea to take our minds off things and grind a few more levels to get strength 10, because I know the strength bobblehead will be at mass fusion. I pass the cure on to Virgil, and hopefully that'll work. Also, cool thing, not only are you allowed to use vertebrates to fly into and out of the glowing sea, but you can also get a much better look at the world there since the fog doesn't spawn in while you're flying in the vertebrate. We finally decide to hit the point of no return by agreeing to attack mass fusion with the Brotherhood, and it's a bit awkward at first because we still can't use the minigun, so we just sit there patiently and do three laps around the roof before we're allowed to jump out and blue skidoo everything that moves. What's hilarious about this whole level is that not only do I forget to grab the strength bobblehead, but the game also drops another legendary lever action rifle, which I cannot use because I did not legally purchase it. What matters is that we got the power supply for Liberty Prime and we're ready to start the end game. Liberty Prime lives again, and he goes right over to the Institute and blows a literal hole into the CIT campus so that we can use it to enter the Institute and murder their murder Roombas. It's at this point that I tire of these squabbles. The Institute's resistance is just an exercise in futility. It's time to take the blue skidoo to its full potential. Domain Expansion. Golden State. With this blinding light, there is nothing I cannot see and nothing I cannot strike with the blue skidoo. With my total strength stat now at 16 with all my gear bonuses and my lower action point requirement in vats, I can hit as many enemies as I can see. This is not a battle. This is a formality. I will level this facility and I will level it without using any weapons with a magazine capacity of over 10 rounds or with automatic fire. There is nothing you can do to stop me and all your attempts to slow me down are mildly annoying at best. Please stop. I have other videos I want to make. Die! And we did it. We saved the Commonwealth. And we did it without any automatic weapons, no explosives, no destructive devices, nothing 50 caliber or higher, no silenced weapons, no high capacity or quick reloading magazines, no giggling, no smiling, no leaded pipes for potable water, no scavenged ammo, no armor piercing modifications, no using lead based ammunition against animals you're hunting, and a lot of other rules that were just so oddly specific there was nowhere I could fit them into the flow of this video. It. Is. Done. Oh yeah, I still need to do Trinity Tower. This was actually pretty disappointing as I am severely over leveled for it. I shall lift our spirits by voting from the bar. Good night. Yeah, I'm not listening to any of that. Bye. Holy shit, it's finally done. This was a video that literally started out as a joke in my Discord that I thought I'd get out in a month and during the holiday seasons and before I went to MAGFest no less. This video took four months and change. The playthrough alone was 90 hours and when I set my recording software to split the recording every 15 minutes so that I could reasonably organize everything I've done, there were so many like files, it brought File Explorer to its knees. Part of the reason why I divided this video up into play sessions is because I needed to put all the files from this run into a bunch of different subfolders and the best way to organize it was in the same way I organized my notes, which I have 17 pages of. Thank goodness I did that too because there was so much stuff that happened that even with small clips that I could easily label with specific things in them, I'd miss a lot of stuff if I wasn't taking notes. Would I want to do this again or with another Fallout game? I'm not sure. I did give it thought, and if I wanted to do it again or with a different game, New Vegas would be the best bet because not only does it have a survival mode, but it also has a lot of weapons that it would easily get by the rules. And plus, I wouldn't have to deal with ditching all those legendary spawns. Plus, reloading your own ammo is a thing in that game. New Vegas would also be a lot faster of a playthrough because none of that settlement stuff. But that also means that I have no easy way to get levels in the early game or a reliable source of food and water because I think keeping the Vault 13 canteen would ruin the challenge. Fallout 3 is kind of a no-go because the waiting periods would be ne meaningless without needing to eat, drink, or rest. 
As for refining the rule set, yeah, I could totally see a bunch of places where things could be improved or streamlined. I mainly focused on the rules around what kind of a firearm you're allowed to own and how you can procure it, but halfway through the playthrough, someone mentioned CCW rules, which I hadn't thought of. And again, for the umpteenth time, I'm not an attorney and can only delve into the California Penal Code so thoroughly. For the millionth time, this is also nothing in this constitutes legal advice. And then on the other note, for like, trying to follow the law as closely as possible, I could also just be a hardcore stickler for rules and say that anything that is not explicitly regulated or allowed in the penal code or anywhere for like California compliance is a no-go. Eliminating all like the laser and energy weapons, eliminating like the gauss rifle and possibly power armor, but that would be absolutely brutal. And again, it's just like, I did a framework for this challenge. There is so much I could do and eventually I had to just play it. And finally on the note, of post-mortem stuff, I'm further discouraged from doing another one of these, or at least another one in the near future, because I have a lot of other cool projects I really want to get around to. There's the Promise for Patron video, such as the Disco Elysium video and the Patron Voted Pathologic 2 video, and I also last year got my hands on original copies of the Transformer Cybertron trilogy, and yes, that is a trilogy, and there's a reason you forgot about the third game, and I really, really want to do a video on those. Here's a uh, two bits of trivia about me and challenge runs before we go. First is that this is actually my second challenge run. My first was done a little over 11 years ago when I first started my channel and did a let's play challenge run of Bioshock where I played using only the wrench and plasmids. Most of those videos don't exist anymore, but here's a clip from one of the ones I kept around to remind myself how far I've come. Oh, and this turret too. I'm having a good time right now. You cannot have a bad time when what happened last episode happened. I, that is victory right there. The second is that I almost called this off. About a week after me and the guys in the Discord got the idea for this, and I was neck deep in research, we got the news about Mitten Squad. I don't want to dwell on this too much because I don't want to be sleazy. The gist of it is that I held off on making this because I didn't want to act like some kind of vulture, nor did I want to make it seem like I was trying to immediately muscle into this new niche. Hell, I'm not even sure I'm going to do another run remotely like this because geez, this was a Herculean task. In the end, I decided that it'd be best to do this in honor of his memory, and rather than the usual YouTuber slop calls to actions, I'd like to suggest that if you liked this video or found anything about what I did here interesting, maybe consider doing a challenge run in Mitten's memory. It doesn't have to be this one, but if you really want, I've got my rule set in the description. It doesn't have to be made into a video. No one's ever truly gone until we stop thinking about them. And that's why I make sure to thank my inspirations for both cooking and making videos in the credits of every video I make. Now, I've had you all here for long enough, so let's do our sign off. Remember that no matter what you do, be it challenge runs, mosaics, or ballet, what you do as your passion is never to be referred to as content. It is art. Content is a word that has been warped into meeting a means to grind up all your passions, skills, and dreams into a gray slop that is meant for nothing more than to make a line go up at someone else's benefit. Your art in no way deserves that. Your art is inalienable, a reflection of you by the very nature of its creation, and you in no way deserve to be ground up into content. So in all that you do, fight against the contentification of the world by fighting for your art. You are worth it. Now stay saucy, everyone. Saucy boy, we are trying to fold the laundry. And as I understand, I should turn this way down. As I understand it, you are refusing to allow these last few things of laundry to be folded. You will not move. What is your deal? Laundry boy. Oh yeah, I'm gonna pet you. You can't stop me from petting you. I'm gonna give you a little scratch on your chin because you're just a sweet little boy. You're a sweet little boy with a little bow tie who won't get off the laundry. Why are you like this? Can I can I get can I take a hoodie? Oh wow, he's he's really he's got a grip on this. What about some sweatpants? Oh, oh no, he's, he, you've got your closet on me, a little. I don't think I'm getting this laundry back. I don't even think I'm going to get this bed to sleep in tonight. 
Look at the face of evil right here. 